I want to speak today about the ethical philosophy of John Stuart Mill, who was a 19th century English philosopher. John Stuart Mill called his view utilitarianism. I'll come back to that name in a moment. And he wrote a book of that same name. And I want to talk today in particular about chapter one of this, this very famous book. Mill starts off his book by saying that morality is in sort of a strange place because morality has to do with practical reasoning. It has to do with the reasoning that one does when one is thinking about how to act, what to do. And so the natural place to start is to think about what, in acting, quite generally, should we be trying to attain? What is our goal? And so then the idea would be, once we figure out what our goal is, then we'll think about how to attain that goal. This is sort of what we do in any sort of action that we do. We think about the sorts of things we're trying to achieve, and then we think about what actions I can undertake to try to achieve those goals. And the funny thing about morality, Mill says, is that if we put it in these very general terms, um, what am I trying to attain most generally, most uh, fundamentally, um, we haven't actually even been able to agree on that, much less on how to go about getting it. Okay? And so the, the complaint is that morality is in a sort of backward state. Okay? We ought to be able to say something about what we want to achieve, what, what goals we have, and then think about how to achieve those goals. And we haven't even decided on what this ultimate goal is. And, and Mill assumes that what the highest goal of action ought to be is something that's fundamentally good. And so he'll often speak of the highest good, uh, summum bonum in Latin, which you may see in his, in his book or elsewhere. Um, and so the idea is, let's figure out what this summum bonum is, this highest good, and then we'll think about how to achieve that highest good. Okay. And in setting up this, this view this way, Mill is classifying his view. Uh, he wouldn't have put it this way, but we put it this way now. Um, Mill is, in effect, subscribing to a view we now call consequentialism. Consequentialism. And consequentialism says just that, that ethics is about trying to maximize the good. That is, the consequentialist defines right action in terms of what is good. Okay, <clears throat> So the picture is that there are things in the universe that just have a kind of um, intrinsic value. I'll come back to that phrase in a moment. They just have a kind of worth or goodness built into them. And because of that fact, uh, we now know something about how to act, namely we ought to act so as to maximize those good things. Okay. Um, when we come to Immanuel Kant later in the term, we'll see that that uh, he is one of several philosophers who rejected this view of consequentialism. But but the key idea about consequentialism is, is that you define right action in terms of what is good. Okay. The, the question about what is good in the universe is sort of the fundamental question, and then we define how we ought to act based on our answer to that. Okay. Tell us what is good, then right action will be a matter of trying to promote or maximize that good. Okay, so then the million dollar question, of course, is, well, what does Mill think is the highest good in this world? Okay. Now, just to, just to make it clear here, Mill is certainly being a very, very much a realist about this. He doesn't think that that uh, goodness is somehow a matter that's relative to society or culture or individual taste. He actually believes, and many ethicists have followed him in this, that there are certain things that are good in and of themselves, intrinsically, whether or not anybody ever actually values them or, or desires them or anything like that. <clears throat> there are things that just have a kind of objective, absolute value. Okay. Now, um, Mill talks about various things that might be the highest good, and he says, 
Well, here's one major contender for the title of highest good, human happiness. Okay. Human happiness. And this is, in fact, the view that he's going to be defending in utilitarianism, i.e. that human happiness, which he thinks of in terms of pleasure and an absence of pain, um, is this sought after highest good. Okay. Now, if it's going to be the highest good, it's going to be something that's good in and of itself. Okay. So contrast this. Contrast the notion of the highest good with, with what might fairly be called lower goods. Okay. So for example, take something like money. Now, money is plausibly a good thing, um, even if the love of money is not. Money is plausibly a good thing. But notice that it's not good in and of itself. You don't value the money just for the sake of the money, right? You value the money for the things that the money can get you. That is, you value the money as an instrument to the achievement of higher goods. Okay? So the money, if you have enough of it and in the right place and so on, can get you what you really desire. Right? And so the question that we're after is not which things are good at all, because that would include things like money and all sorts of other things, but the question is, what sorts of things are good in and of themselves? What sorts of things are valuable just for their own sake? Okay, that's the question. <clears throat> now, um, here's the thing about this sort of ordering of goods, if we're, if we're going to think of it in this terms. Um, notice that if we've got a picture according to which some goods are lower than others, and there's a kind of uh, regress of, of goods, or a kind of chain of goods, and at the top is supposed to be the highest good. Mill points out that you can use goods that are higher up on the chain to show that goods lower down are, in fact, good things. Okay, so here's an example. How does one prove, for example, that, uh, that the practice of medicine is a good thing? Well, you can show that the practice of medicine conduces to health. You can show that the practice of medicine has helped us to learn something about how to be healthy, about how to improve our health, how to maintain our health, and so on. And health is a good thing. And therefore, medicine, because it helps us to promote our health, is a good thing. Okay, so again, notice the structure of that. Health is a sort of medium-level good. Medicine is something lower down on the list. But we prove that medicine is good by pointing out that it helps us get one of these higher goods. Okay? And so then you see the structure is, health is a good thing, medicine helps us lead to health, and therefore medicine is also a good thing. Okay? <clears throat> and so there's a sort of very natural way of proving that some things are good. Okay? Of course, this is all based on the assumption that health is a good thing but presumably that, that is more or less undeniable. Now the trouble, Mill says, is that if we're going to try to prove that the highest good is in fact the highest good, then we can't use that strategy. Right? The strategy before was to point to prove that something was good was to show that it leads to or conduces to some higher good. But if we're talking about trying to prove the ultimate goodness of the highest good, then there is no higher good to which we can point to try to prove the goodness of that ultimate good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if human happiness really is the highest good, well, we could certainly use happiness to prove the goodness of other things that lead to it. We could argue, for example, that health must be good because it leads to happiness, or, or uh, uh, pleasure is good because it's a part of happiness, or, or examples like that. But we won't be able to use the, this sort of uh, hierarchical structure of good in order to prove the goodness of the highest good, which Mill says is human happiness. Okay, and so we're going to have to try to prove the goodness of, of, ha of, uh, of happiness by some other means. Okay, I'll leave off for, there, for, there, for today and we'll pick up there next time.